Thank you, Ryan, for leading us. And thank you, Sindel. Sindel's gone uh, upstairs. I know she did a great job. Uh, yesterday, I watched her slam dunk at the ball game. And today, she's uh, slam dunking it here. So she did a great job. Uh, and I'm uh, so thankful for our children's ministries and uh, the many ways that our kids are able to get involved and grow in the gospel. Uh, if you have your Bibles, I want to ask you to open them with me to the book of Genesis chapter 37. Genesis 37, we'll continue in our series that we've been going now through, now through several months, going through every single chapter, verse of the book of Genesis. We find ourselves now in Genesis chapter 37. It's a real turning point, I think, of, of the book of Genesis. This is probably the most familiar spot for a lot of us is, is now what will entail the story of Joseph. And uh, his story is, is going to take up a great portion of the rest of this uh, wonderful book that we have before us. So uh, I'm going to read uh, with you. We're going to look at Genesis 37, just the first two verses, actually the first verse and, and part of the second. And uh, we're going to read the rest in the context of our sermon today. But uh, let's just look at this passage together. If you turn to Genesis 37, I'd like to invite you to stand with me this morning as we honor the reading of God's Word together. And we uh, just look at the first two verses as Moses, the writer of Genesis, as the Holy Spirit would uh, uh, impart to him, this is what he writes. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Now, let me pray for us this morning. You pray with me. Lord, we thank you again for this time we have to stand before you as your people today to take in your word. Lord, to whom else could we go? For you have the words of life. And what I have to say is not important, or, or, nor what any one who would stand before us is, but God, your word lasts forever. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to impart truth to us today. We can't understand it unless you do. And yet you have made it understandable to us. Help us to be focused, our attention to be sharp. Lord, I know that oftentimes our mind might be grazing to other fields, but let us be able to ingest fully and completely your good word. Sometimes, Lord, it's like honey in our mouth and turns sour as it goes down, as it begins to do its work of conviction. But I know that it's the work we need. So let it do its work in us today. We give you this time, and we will respond with nothing less than an amen. And yes, so be it, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing with me this morning. I heard the story about two guys, I guess you could call them morons, if I can say that word. Sometimes it's just the only word you can use, isn't it? And uh, they had just gotten a job with a local pole company. And their job was this, that they were to measure all the poles in town. And so they came to the first pole there, shooting stray way up in the air, and they've got a measuring tape with them. One of them's going to hold the tape at the bottom, the other one's going to climb up to the top. And so that guy begins climbing. He can only get just a, few, you know, just a couple of feet off the ground, maybe before he falls again. He's not having any success. And they wonder how in the world we're going to measure these, uh, the height of these poles. And so along comes this other guy, big strapping guy, and he's... <coughs> Big fella, and he says, what are you guys doing? And he said, well, we're trying to measure the height of this pole. And he says, okay. And he goes over that pole, and he pulls it out of the ground. This big guy does. Pulls it right out of the ground, lays it on the ground. He takes that measuring tape. He stretches it from one end to the other. and comes back to him and says, that's 40 feet. Picks that pole up, lays it back in the ground. Those morons say, thank you. They look at each other when he walks off, and this is what they say. What an idiot. We wanted the height, not the length of that pole. <laughs> now listen, I hope that you can say about yourself, you're sharper than that, all right? Others may not say that, but that you would say it about yourself. Listen, made in the image of God, we have been given an amazing capacity to use our minds. To think and to think sharply. 
He, he broadens our knowledge every single day, but particularly He does so through the reading and the hearing of His Word. Uh, the Word of God is, is told to, to us to be like a, a path for our feet, a light for our path, right? It gives us understanding. It makes us sharp, not just in life, in, 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 a, in a full knowledge but uh, of, of, of facts and information, but of even knowing Him. It's not just the, the gathering of information, but it's knowing Him. However, though God has given us this amazing capacity for His glory to use our knowledge, the Bible itself does not paint a very pretty picture of us. In fact, if you were to study the Scriptures, Old and New Testament alike, here are some of the, the adjectives used to describe us. Simple-minded, dull, stiff-necked, and slow to understand. Probably the most oft-used caricature of an animal for us is that of a sheep. And as any good shepherd knows, sheep aren't the brightest bulbs on the farm. They tend to not be as wise or as intelligent in their mental prowess as the other animals. But there's hope. Psalm 119, 130 says this. You'll see it behind me. The unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. When I read God's Word, when you read God's Word under the direction and the leading of the Holy Spirit, He takes a simple-minded person, and all of us are, and He gives us understanding. He imparts knowledge to us. And again, it's not just historical facts. While there are many facts to learn in Scripture, many names and places and events that have occurred, that's not the primary reason for God's Word to us. It's not to know things, but it's to know a person. Amen. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, it's to know Him. It's not just the basis for morality and ethics, though the Bible certainly imparts that to us. And we desperately need it. It's not so much to know things as it is to know Him. In fact, John 5.39, you'll see this behind me as well. Listen to what Jesus states to His opponents. He says, You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about Me. Jesus was speaking to the lawyers, the religious leaders of His day who knew the Scriptures better than any one of us in here sitting right now. And yet they rejected Christ. And, and listen, He doesn't refute their knowledge of the Scriptures. He says, you think your knowledge of the Bible is what saves you. Sometimes we can fall into line with that. We think because of our religious activity we're saved. No, what he says is that, that instead the Scriptures point to me. So that you can know me. Listen to what Jesus is saying. When you pick up the Bible and you read it, you listen to it, you engage with it, you understand it, you memorize it, and you seek to obey it, what is happening is, is that you're walking in a relationship with God Himself. You're knowing Jesus. And so... We're invited to do so even today as we listen to it together. But herein lies the problem, I think, sometimes. Uh, we find it difficult to listen, don't we? Uh, our, our minds are scattered for what's going to happen tomorrow, what happened earlier today, what, what's got to be done, uh, worries and concerns that are heavy on us. And it doesn't help that we have more technology now than we've ever had before. And so... More often than not, now we get our information in little snippets, don't we? We speak to our phone and we ask a question and we get the answer back. Little snippets of information. We don't want to know the whole story. We don't want to spend too much time studying the thing. We just want to know a quick answer for our busy lives. And so certainly, any book, much less a book, that perhaps is thousands of pages according to whatever the size of the lettering is in your copy, and is thousands of years old, is difficult for us to understand, and we find it hard to engage with it to fit it into our busy lives. A.W. Tozer wrote about this problem years ago, but it sounds pretty uh, informative for our own day. Look what he says behind me. Why does today's Christian find the reading of great books always beyond him? Certainly, intellectual powers do not wane from one generation to another. We are as smart as our fathers, and any thought they could entertain, we can entertain if we are sufficiently interested in making the effort. 
The major cause of the decline in the quality of current Christian literature is not intellectual, but spiritual. To enjoy a great religious book requires a degree of consecration to God and detachment from the world that few modern Christians have. The early Christian fathers, the mystics, the Puritans, are not hard to understand, but they inhabit the highlands where the air is crisp and rarefied, and none but the God enamored can come. One reason why people are unable to understand great Christian classics is that they are trying to understand without the intention of obeying. And so, I want to invite you as we continue today, but even in the coming weeks, as we're going to study the life of Joseph. And here's why. Because it, it's discipline. But the story of Joseph is a riveting. It would make for any great movie or novel today. As we see of the, the, the events and the activities that happen in this man's life, remember, the book of Genesis is 50 chapters long and almost one third of it is consumed by the life of Joseph. It's an important story to tell. It's not just him, but it's all of Jacob's sons. And like any good biography, you're going to see yourself in the, in the pages of this story. But more than that, you're going to see someone else to which our attention should turn. We're going to encounter Christ. I like what uh, John Phillips, who wrote an excellent commentary on Genesis Rights, you'll see this behind me. He says this, Of all the people who come and go on the busy, crowded pages of the Word of God, where can we find a life that more beautifully portrays the life of Jesus than the life of Joseph? Touch the life of Joseph at any point, and instantly this or that aspect of the person or work of Christ will be revealed. It was that characteristic that gave Joseph the right to occupy such a prominent position in Genesis. The great goal of the Holy Spirit in the life of any person is to make Him like Christ. And when He does at last exhibit the beauties of the Lord Jesus, He becomes a trophy of grace worthy of deathless display. That's what we have with Joseph in his life. Now, as we start this, I, I stated earlier, this point in Genesis, Genesis 37, is really a turning point in, in the book of Genesis because it will focus so much on the sons of Jacob and, and in particular Joseph. And so it's helpful, I think, to just kind of see what are going to be some recurring themes, okay, for us and for any reader of Scripture as we look for this. There's four of these. This is not the points in your bulletin this morning, but these are some things that we can hang on to. Here's the first one. The fulfillment of the covenant of Abraham will be an important point to remember, okay? Remember, um, uh, from Genesis chapter 3, we're promised uh, a Savior who will come. It's called the Proto-Evangelium. It means that, that from the, even the point in which sin entered the world, God already had a plan in place to save the world through a Messiah who would come. He chooses Abraham through faith, Abraham's faith, and through that family eventually to, to send this one. And so it's a fulfillment of the covenant in Genesis chapter 12. Verses 1 through 3 specifically, God told Abraham, I'll give you a, a, a great family, a nation of people. I'll give you a land. You'll be a blessing to the whole world. And so we're, we're going to see the fulfillment of that promise through the sons of Jacob. Next is this, redemption for the world through the sending of a Savior. All right? I want you to understand again, everything in Scripture always points to Jesus. He is the key to unlocking everything else. Everything's going to be looking to the cross and His resurrection and His soon return. And so it is true with Genesis as well. The story of redemptions is continuing to be told in Genesis. Here's the third thing. God will use evil to accomplish His good purpose. And this is an important thing. Because we're going to see in the life of Joseph, he has great evil that comes against him. Not deserved. It's nothing of his own works that accomplishes this, but it's God and His sovereignty showing that He brings about His own good purpose even in the midst of bad things, even using bad things. God does not leave evil unchecked. We'll see this. He's not the author of it, and yet He will use it. Here's the last and final thing. Joseph is a type of Christ. See, there's a particular type of study in the Scriptures that's called typology. It means that, that we can look at characters and individuals throughout the Old Testament and find in them that they are pointing to Jesus. And Joseph is one of these. You're going to see in his life 
clear indicators that point to, wow, that sounds like Jesus. That sounds like His story. That sounds like what we know of the Savior. And so, it is a wonderful opportunity for us to do, this, do so again. So we're going to read this entire chapter. We're going to do it in part, stopping intermittently, just so that we get a good understanding of what's happening in the text. So you can, you can open your Bibles or your, uh, uh, your uh, device there, or you can look behind me, as this will be in front of you as well. Let's start in Genesis 37, <clears throat> and looking there at the second part of verse 2, and we're going to read down through verse 4. Note what he states here. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pastoring the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Another translation states, could not say a kind word to him. Not about him or to him. <clears throat> Joseph is the eleventh son of Jacob. But it was by four different women. So you can imagine the conflict that's going on in that home. There's enough conflict for one man and one woman. But think about one man with four women. And different children by different women. There is much conflict that has been set up. He and Benjamin are the 11th and 12th sons. Their mother was Jacob's favorite, Rachel. And so by acts of favoritism, Joseph would show a greater sense of liking toward him than the others. It doesn't mean that he didn't love the other sons. He just showed them greater favor. I think all of us have seen this happen in a family. Maybe we've experienced it ourselves. There's a, a liking or a favoritism for one sibling over another. And so it is with Joseph. Now, what we find is, is that Joseph's been sent by his father to be with the other sons as they're working out in the field. But here's what's interesting. Joseph gives a bad report about them. And what we're going to find as we read the story of Joseph and his brothers is in fact, that bad report was probably well deserved. These were not men of high character. And we're going to see that fruit begin to bear. We've seen it in previous chapters. It will continue to unfold. Here's what's really interesting. Moses tells us that in fact, Joseph has been given what is called a coat of many colors. This has uh, brought about much attention in history. What exactly does this mean? The exact Hebrew word is difficult to understand exactly what it means. But here's what is quite certain we think. Is that it made him stand out to such a degree that here's the real point. You don't work. You don't do hard labor in a coat like that. You see, none of the other brothers had that privilege. They're all out working in the field, but but Joseph shows up on the scene and he doesn't have to do that kind of work because those aren't work clothes he's got on. He's got on a suit. He doesn't do hard labor in that way. The point was very clear. Jacob was choosing Joseph to be the one who would be the primary in the family. And you can imagine the envy that would result against these men of bad character. Nothing of Joseph's own doing and yet it comes just the same. So much so that it says they have no good word to say about they don't say anything good to Joseph. Every time they walk by him, he's, he's their flesh and blood, and yet this is the relationship. Now, let's look on in verses 5 through 11. Note what we read in the Scriptures. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were blind, binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it. And bowed down to my sheep. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him 
but his father kept the saying in mind. We read here that Joseph has a couple of dreams. He will go on to have more as we read his story. And what's interesting is, is that in the Old Testament, there are occasions where God will speak to people in dreams. And this is the way in which He reveals His Word to them. Remember, Old Testament believers do not have the finished Word of God as we have today. The question often comes, what about my dreams? Perhaps you have crazy dreams. What, what are we to think of these things? Can God speak through dreams? Well, I don't want to be one to say what God can't do. But here, very clearly, what we see is a pattern as we come to the New Testament. God doesn't do it very much. In fact, we see it declining in nature as the Scriptures go on to a test. And so, God speaks through His Word to us. But to Joseph, He was speaking through a dream. And here in this dream... He is imparting this wisdom, this knowledge. It wasn't difficult to interpret. There would be difficulty to interpret dreams at times. These dreams are not difficult for Joseph or his dad or any of his brothers to interpret. They've heard the song and dance. Joseph's going to be the one to lead us all. Joseph's more important than the rest of us. We're all going to bow down to Joseph. Listen, they hated him before. They hate him even more now. And they, they set in mind a plan to make sure he will never rule over this family. They're so jealous. They're so envious. The question has been asked, well, perhaps Joseph shouldn't have mentioned this dream to his brothers. But again, I think we're going to see as the story plays out, it's not the character of Joseph to which should be questioned, but the character of his brothers. And even his father... In the, in the matter of these things, if, Job, if uh, Jacob's other sons, if Jacob himself had listened to the dreams, they would have saved themselves perhaps much grief. They choose not to. Let's go on. As God is accomplishing His purposes through this, look with me at verse 12 down to 17. It says, Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. And the man said, They have gone away. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Now this set of verses leaves us with a lot of questions. It left me with a lot of questions as I was studying. Why would the sons of Jacob go to pasture their flocks in Shechem, which was a good 34 mile, 40 miles, 30 or 40 miles north of Hebron, where they were located close to it's a place where their family had experienced much violence. It had brought them great grief in earlier chapters. Why wouldn't they stay closer to home? Why would the sons of Jacob go so far off? Well, it seems to be only one reason. Because they didn't want Dad to know what they were doing in the fields. They didn't want other people to know. They were hiding something. Again, we're seeing their character coming out. They're not perhaps working quite as hard. They're playing a little bit more than they're working as they should be, and so they go far off where they won't be seen. But more perplexing than that question is why in the world would a good father, Jacob, knowing that the other sons hate Joseph, this should have been obvious, why would he send him out to them like a sheep to the slaughter? Certainly something bad could happen. Undoubtedly, Jacob has this problem of passivity in his parenting. He's not dealing with things in his children, character flaws and issues as he should. He's not disciplining as he should. He overlooks these things. But perhaps the greatest question is this. If God's in control, why in the world when Joseph comes to the field... Does he run into this man who is unnamed in Scripture? Because it seems like Joseph could have been spared from a lot of pain if he hadn't run into this character who happened to overhear about the brothers and where they would be and then points them in that direction. Joseph would have gone, not found his brothers, and gone home. And everybody would have been spared a lot of pain. But instead, God sends this man. There's been questions in some commentaries. Perhaps this was even 
an angel that was there, sent of the Lord, to be in that field to direct Joseph in the right place where he ought to go. It doesn't make sense. Why would God allow and even send Joseph into an evil situation, into a situation that would cause great pain to the entire family? It makes no sense. But I do like what a couple of authors say about this matter. Warren Wiersbe writes an excellent commentary on this. And this is what he states. He says, The answer is that the providential hand of God was working to accomplish His divine purposes for Jacob and his family, and ultimately the whole world. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. Psalm 105, 17. God had ordained that Joseph would go to Egypt, and this was the way he accomplished it. Hundreds of years prior, Martin Luther, on his commentary, wrote these words, In such danger we see the deepest silence of God and the angels. But behold, how much good draws forth from this. Listen, sometimes God is silent. Sometimes God seemingly sends us or appears has put us in a bad situation. But there's a plan here we see for Joseph and for his brothers. Genesis 37, 18-24. Look with me as we... Continue on. It says this, They saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we'll say that a fierce animal has devoured him and we'll see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colors that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Strangely enough, the very robe that Jacob had crafted for his favored son was the reason why the brothers could plan so well his demise. They could see him in a distance. Nobody wears a robe like that but our hated brother. So let's plan. How are we going to do it? When he comes, how are we going to grab him? How are we going to force him into a situation? Their first plan, of course, is to kill him. They'll end him right here. Do you know what they said? We'll see what becomes of his dreams now, how they come to fruition. We'll put an end to him right now. Reuben and his character begins to shine forth. There's a little glimmer of hope here. He's the only brother. He's the eldest. And he comes forward and he says, let's don't kill him. This is significant. Reuben was the firstborn. He should have been the one to be the favored son, you would think. But more than this, we read just a couple of chapters ago that Reuben had committed an act against his father that put him in bad graces. Perhaps Reuben is thinking, I already know what it's like to be on dad's bad side. I don't want to be on it anymore. And I'm going to be responsible if Joseph doesn't return safely. And so he seeks to protect him somehow. And he suggests, rather than killing him, let's throw him into a pit. It's interesting, this pit. We have some inclination in the rest of Scripture, perhaps what it is. It's actually a dry well or a a cistern. And they throw him down into this. It could be quite deep. We're not giving any indication. It could be that, that Joseph is hurt rather severely by the fall itself. Here's what's clear. He can't get out. He would not be able to get out with assistance. They would have to, to lower some type of, of object to pull him out. He could not do so alone. And so they throw Joseph into the deep pit. Now we look at verse 25 and 28. As the story continues, then they sat down to eat. And looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. When Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by and they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. Now this was a, a common trade route in 
this time in biblical history. It was not uncommon to have these caravans selling and buying goods as they would be heading to Egypt. The eldest, Reuben, had lost the respect of his brothers. We read this. They wouldn't listen necessarily to him. They had it at some way, but, but they really had disregarded what he wanted. But they listened to Judah. We're going to see more and more of this. There's a little hint of uh, what to expect in the Scriptures. Why? Because from the line of Judah comes the Messiah. This brother will begin to take prominence by God's own choosing, not by his character. Judah says, let's sell him. Let's go kill him. It's decided it would be more profitable. It would put something in their back pockets. They would have something to show, perhaps, rather than just a guilty conscience. The thought of them lifting him from the pit to be handed over to slave traders is almost bare, unbearable. I mean, don't overlook what we just read. After they threw him in the pit, they sat down and they ate around that pit. And they listened to their brother scream. It's rather disturbing. Note what John Phillips writes again in his commentary. He says this, Thus the cruel deal was closed and Joseph was led away. His cries and entreaties falling on deaf ears. What cared the Ishmaelites for a Hebrew's tears? What cared Judah and Simeon and Levi and the sons of the bond women? It had been their lucky day. They had rid themselves of a rival and lined their purses besides. It was a fine bargain in cash. But was it? Each of the ten pocketed a wretched two pieces of silver, and each inherited, inherited a conscience that would never rest again. There are some deals that are too expensive for the soul to permit. Some moments of indulgence, some stolen pleasures, it would be better to have shunned than to have shared. Right. We read on to the end of the chapter, starting in verse 29, Genesis 37. says, When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robes and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph was without a doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. No indication is given in this set of events as to what happened to Reuben when the brothers make the decision to sell Joseph. But when he arrives, his distress is obvious. Remember, he, he perhaps felt as though he would be held most responsible as the eldest brother. And when he realizes that Joseph has been sold, he already knows the disfavor of his father. So now he thinks perhaps it could get even worse. The brothers... Take that hated ornamented robe. That was really the mark of their hatred, and they tear it to pieces. And then they kill an animal. And they take that animal and they wipe its blood ferociously all over that coat. And yet they do not realize the grief it will bring them in the days and the months and the years that will follow in their lives. The memory of that day will never leave those brothers. Regret and guilt would begin to set in inside of them. And Jacob now is a father who has lost his favored son. And he is in great grief. He's a man who's experienced much loss in his life. Now, he loses Joseph. And Joseph is given over to Pop. He is the chief of the security guards for the most powerful man on the planet. Pharaoh himself. And Joseph has been given over to his household as a slave. So here's, here's the question from this passage. How could such treachery, treachery be used for God's glory 
and for Jacob's sons good. How could it be termed for good? There's four things I think that will help us give us a grasp exactly how we can see it. You can write these down in your notes page in your bulletin. Here's the first. I want you to take note of a family that is in deep distress. This family is in deep distress. We just can't read the passage without recognizing Jacob's family in this case. Is there any wonder that there's such dissension and hatred and division and deception and violence growing in the sons of Jacob? Jacob listen. Jacob had fostered this kind of family. He had children by four different women. And as this occurred, it, it, it caused more brokenness. It caused more distress. There's a reason that God tells us in Genesis and again in the New Testament that His plan for a family is one man, one woman for life. That's right. After that, things start to get kind of difficult. Even in that, things get difficult. And so we, we see it playing out. And, and Jacob has much passivity as a parent. There's times when he should have said something to his sons. He should have done something about their actions, but he, he seemingly lets it just go. It's the picture of a father sitting in front of the television as his children run rampant, busy at work, attending to matters, not realizing that his children are dying in front of him. This we see in Jacob and his passive ways with his sons. He has silence over the character flaws and it's deafening. You know, there's a, there's a glimpse in this passage too that provides for us a sense of a biblical truth that we'll read about in the New Testament. It comes from Galatians chapter 6. Don't be a fool. God will not be mocked. Whatever man sows, that will he also reap. You know, it was just a couple of few chapters back that we read about Jacob. He deceived his father. You remember how he did it? He killed an animal and then put the, the, the skins of that animal on him so that he could deceive his father. Now his sons kill an animal and deceive him about what they've done to his favorite son. You see, there's not much greater things in life that are more heart-wrenching than brokenness in a family. It runs deep. But here's where there's hope in the Scriptures. God came to put back together broken families through His grace. In fact, one of my favorite promises of the coming Messiah is found in, in the last verse of the Old Testament. It's Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. And listen to what it says. You'll see it behind me. It says, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Now this is a passage prophesying the ministry of John the Baptist, but more specifically the ministry of Christ. And certainly it means that, that people will turn back to the Lord. But more than that, specifically it means this, that a particular ministry of God and His grace is to restore Husbands and wives and fathers and children and mothers and children and siblings and brokenness that is in a family. That is God's intent in the sending of Messiah. Amen. His special promise. Have you ever noticed, if you're a parent, grandparent, working with children, that there seems to be a great lack in Scripture of specific how-tos about how you can be a good parent. However, you can go to a local Christian bookstore or get online and find all kinds of how-to books about how to be a great parent. In his excellent book, Sacred Parenting, Gary Thomas writes about this. Look behind me. This is what he states. The silence of the Bible on the plan for parenting, along with the repetition of the Bible on spiritual growth, could lead us to conclude that God believes the parent's own spiritual growth is the most essential part of the how-to of parenting. That's right. In other words, God may be telling us, grow in me every day in faith, patience, virtue, love, and worship, and let that faith and growth perfume your house and anoint your children. Amen. Don't you ever get tired of hearing, say, hearing this? Well, you do that because the Bible tells you so. Well, there's a good reason. That's right. It's sometimes not very complicated. You do what the Bible says in your life, and it'll begin to outgrow as a husband, a wife, a parent, uh, whatever case it might be. 
God came to heal brokenness in the family. Now here's the second thing we can know from this passage. Is that we see a God who is in complete control. And we cannot overlook this fact. You see, in the tragedy of Genesis chapter 37, it is a tragic chapter. We take note of Jacob's passivity, his son's treachery, and maybe perhaps even Joseph's naivety of thinking his brothers would receive well news of a dream. <clears throat> However, it is God's sovereignty that rules the act. God's in control of this. Know what one commentator writes behind me. He says, years later, Jacob will lament, all these things are against me. In Genesis 42. When actually, all these things were working for him. This doesn't mean that God approved of or engineered the brothers' hatred, deception, or that they weren't responsible for what they did. It does mean that our God is so great that He can work out His purposes even when people are doing their worst. Perhaps bad things are happening to you right now. Perhaps evil is working against you. Evil certainly abounds all around us in our culture today. We seem to sense that it's growing more and more. And in such circumstances, we are tempted to despair that somehow God has lost control, or somehow what are we to do? How can we fix the situation or the problem? But most certainly this, we have to hang on to the promise of God that He is in control. That even when, like this passage, characters are evil and they do bad things against us, things we don't deserve, things we haven't earned, nevertheless, that God is working all things out for His glory and for our good. There's an unseen hand that is working to make all things. And in Jacob's life, in this, Joseph's life, in this passage, we see this. Now here's the third thing I want you to take note of. That there is a character, there is a character in deliberate development. A character in deliberate development. I love what Alexander McLaren, a great preacher of the past, note what he writes about character. Look behind me. If our likeness to God does not show itself in trifles, what is there left for it to show itself in? For our lives are all made up of trifles. The great things come, three or four of them, in the 70 years. The little ones, every time the clock ticks. Listen, every single day, your character is being developed, but also you are proving your character. God is going to use Joseph for great things. We're going to read in coming passages that Joseph is going to become, quite frankly, the most powerful man in the world Second only to the Pharaoh of Egypt. God will use him for the saving of many lives. Listen, he can be trusted with great things because Joseph is a man of great character. He would sit on the throne of Egypt. Why? Because he was the same man on the throne that he was in the bottom of the pit. Oh, that's right. He's a man of character. And we see it and we see how God is developing his character. Listen, God would take the mockery of his family, the betrayal of his brothers, the abuse of his captors, and he would prove his character and he would also shape his character. See, we think that bad things that come are a problem and God sees it as a tool to shape us, mold us. Here's the question. What difficulties are you facing right now of which you cry out to God about to which he says no? I'm going to shape you no matter what. I'm going to mold you. I'm going to make you. Are you a person of character on the bottom as much as you would be on the top because you can't have it both? Here Joseph shows this. Even when he's mistreated. Now here's the last thing I want you to take note of. And this is most important. A Savior in earnest expectation. A Savior. Listen. If there's any call that we hear from Genesis 37, it is a deep call. Longing for Jesus Christ. We hear it from Joseph's longing for acceptance from his family. We hear it from the secret, devious scheming from his brothers who would, who would plan in, in infanticide, the, the killing, infanticide, the killing of their brother. We hear it from the pleas for help as Joseph cries out from the bottom of a pit. 
We hear it from the shameful regret of Reuben, who has wronged his dad once already and now has to face him again. We hear it from the cries of despair from Jacob, who has lost his dearly beloved son and who carries the weight of responsibility for the character of his sons. Listen, we hear the cry for a Savior. Psalm chapter 6, David writes this. You'll see behind me. He writes this. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul is also greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? You see, the story of every page in the Old Testament is looking to the new and looking to when a Savior will finally come on the scene. And even now, the New Testament's been written and we're living in an age where we're invited to come to Christ. And the longing is still the same. Our world is crying out, Jesus, when will you come? Amen. He has come. He will return. Amen. And yet, in the midst of all that, there's this expectation. Listen, everything in the story of Joseph, in Genesis 37 and the rest of the Bible, is this. It's pointing to Jesus. It's pointing to the cross. It's pointing to His resurrection. It's pointing to a salvation and hope that's found only in Him. We're looking for Him. <clears throat> He's the one that hears our cry. He's the one that meets our need. He alone can save us from our sin. We look to Him. <clears throat> As we will continue the story of Joseph in the coming weeks, and we see how God is going to work in all these things, we pause now at this point. to look to Jesus. Uh, we, we read about great troubles on the pages of Scripture. But you probably don't have to turn to Scripture to find out about troubles. They're probably happening in your life, in your family. Maybe it's brokenness. Maybe it's regret. Maybe it's shame over some mistake. Perhaps it's uh, some betrayal you've experienced. It's someone that's mistreating you right now. All these things are common experiences. But God is working all things for His glory and for your good. What is our responsibility? Well, quite frankly, it's very clear. We're to respond in faith. You see, we're first to respond, just as the gospel would say, we're to, we're to trust in what Christ has done for us. We're to depend on Him in every matter. We're to look to Him and obey Him no matter what. To wait on Him, as the Bible says. And so for you, believer, perhaps who is going through some difficult circumstance, you look to the Lord. You wait. Amen. You trust Him. You be faithful in the circumstances you're passing through. God is able. He'll work all things out. <laughs> See, it all begins really with, with the gospel. Everything in this passage points to this, and I would remind you of it again. It starts with bad news. Bad news is just this, that you and I are cut off from God. Just like the people in this passage we've read. Our sin has cut us off from God. We can't have a relationship with Him both now nor forever. We are enemies of God. We are dead in our sin. But the bad news becomes worse because we realize there's nothing we can do about it. A dead man can't do anything but be dead. And so we can't do anything. We can't fix it. We can't be religious enough, good enough, prayerful enough to make things right with God. It leads to great despair, which leads us to a great Savior. It leads us to good news. The good news is that God did send His Son, Jesus, that He lived a perfect, righteous life in yours and my place, that He died on the cross for our sins, that He rose again so He can forgive us. He can heal the brokenness. He can heal. Which leads us to the best news. The best news is, is that in order to, to know Christ, we have to come to Him in faith. We, the Bible tells us we have to turn from our sin and turn to Christ in faith. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He can heal the brokenness. He can restore us. Listen, Jesus didn't come to fix all our problems. He's not going to take away our problems necessarily. But He did come to make us new. And He will make you new in the middle of your difficulty. And so I would call on you again to reflect on whether or not you have put your hope in this gospel. You see, it's a private decision you have to make. Personal decision. But it can't stay private. It's got to become public for it to be real, sincere, truthful. And so to publicly declare to the world, yes, I follow Christ. Yes, I'll follow Him as Lord and Savior. 
We would invite you to do so today if you've never done that. In just a moment, I'm going to pray for us. And then after I pray, I'm going to give you a time to stand for invitation. Now, here's what that means. It's a time that you're invited to come. If I can pray with you, I'd be glad and honored to do so. If you need to use these steps as a way to pray, or pray right where you are. If you need help understanding more about what it means to follow Christ, or if you want to make public some decision you've made to follow Him, perhaps you want to learn more about baptism and its true meaning, or, or even how to join our church, we could share with you information about that. But whatever it is, you come today and you make certain that you're following Christ. For He works all things out for His glory and our good. Amen. To those who love Him. To those who are called according to His purpose. We pray for you. God, I thank You for Your people gathered here today and the attention that's in this place on Your Word, how we need Your words. Lord, I pray for Your people today who are experiencing great challenges, difficulties, perhaps betrayal, or perhaps they're being mistreated unjustly. Christ, no one knows such mistreatment like you who went to the cross for us, your enemies. So Lord, I pray that they would rise up, strengthen under the weight of such, that they would look to your hope, the promise that comes through the gospel. Remind them, Christ, that they belong to you. Help them to be faithful even in such things. Help us to trust you're working all things out. Lord, I pray for those here today who've never put their trust in you, Jesus, publicly to save. Or perhaps they're religious or even good people. They're not right with you. Or will you bring them to yourself, Holy Spirit, convict again. And God, do your work through us. Lord, I pray that in a, moment, in a moment when we get ready to leave, we can truly say it's well with our soul. We're right with you. And we're working toward that end by your grace. God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.